Hello, it's me. It's Ombra, the uh, Winds Lodge Prefect at the Gray School of Wizardry. And today I am not joined by my, my two usual helpers. We actually uh, did record a video. It is still being edited. Um, I don't know how long that will take, but we are about two-thirds of the way, at least, through February, so a little overdue. So we're changing up the uh, format a little bit here, um, inspired by Provost Kingsley's uh, uh, the candlelight and fireside uh, chats. I have uh, my my flaming cauldron, my uh, my chat by the flaming cauldron. And unfortunately, the thing is so bright you can't even tell that that's a cauldron. I wish there was a, a way that, uh, yeah, it's even getting closer. You really can't tell. But um, it's kind of a neat trick that I, um, I came across to, on, a, on a working, figuring out how to light up an entire cauldron like this, and I should probably maybe do an entire, like, separate video to show you how that's done. It's, it's pretty cool. And it's very hot, too. You don't want to leave this kind of thing, like, unattended. It's really, really hot. So, um, you know, it is, a, a, you know, at least uh, two-thirds, three-quarters of the way through February. Um, the the Winds Lodge challenges have been posted since, since the beginning of the month. Hopefully you have checked them out. Um, Apprentice Julie Alexandra has already completed all four. I am very impressed with that. And there's still time, you know, we still have, uh, let's see, today's the 21st, but it's a leap year. So, uh, what, nine more days that you can, um, to get on that, you know, challenges include uh, creating a, a Lupercalia card along the ideas of creating a Valentine, only use Lupercalia as a theme. Some people think the two holidays are links. I'm not real convinced, but, you know, I, I included some links in, in the forums. You can kind of, you know, draw your own conclusions on that. But if you, if you research the history of Lupercalia, it's a little bit kind of on the, the racy side. So, uh, you know, try to keep your, um, your submissions like uh, maybe not X-rated. Um, I won't ding you if they are, but I don't want anyone to get in uh, trouble, especially me. Uh, so, <laughs> so, you know, and I'm not looking for like, you know, great artistic merit. I probably wouldn't know good art if I saw it. So you can go all Jackson Pollock and throw red paint on the paper to symbolize being splashed with a, a sacrificial blood or, you know, so, you know, there's an idea right there. Very easy merit. Um, I also, starting this month and continuing next month and next month is probably my last month as, as prefect not that i haven't enjoyed doing this very much and i would certainly be willing to to continue but we do have somebody who is interested and um uh i'm really excited about that because it's always good to have you know fresh ideas so if i have the opportunity to, to hand the reins over i would be happy to do that but just for these past couple of months i had gotten the idea, and it was from um, Apprentice Julie Alexander, who talked about um, the element of air being a little bit difficult to work with, and this is something she encountered on a scavenger hunt in one of her classes, and I was like, yeah, air is literally hard to pin down, isn't it? So when I think about how the different departments have challenges that reflect aspects of that department, I was like, well, you know, the Winds Lodge, maybe we should be having a very air specific type of challenges. So I have some of those up this month. There is a, a challenge to uh, do a sylph meditation. The sylph is the, the elemental of, the, of uh, air. And also, uh, I, you know, I, I try to stay away from really in-depth research stuff because I, I, that's really important. I want you to uh, focus that more on your classes. This is supposed to be the more the lighter, social aspect of the school, but there's a little bit of research involved in this one. They come up with three famous people who are, you know, somehow magically related. They could be occultists. Uh, Apprentice Julie Alexandra came up with a, a few authors that have, you know, explore some metaphysical themes, but all people who are born under one of the, the air signs, so uh, Libra, Aquarius, Gemini. And um, also there's a tarot card meditation. Uh, each one of the, the signs has uh, their own tarot card. Uh, you, you know, find yours, meditate on that. And so, so, and then going forward into next month, a little bit of a preview. Um, if you go, if you look on our old forum page, which um, is, is really kind of hidden, you still can get to it. 
um, when, you, when you log into your account. But there's like all these associations, like what, what gems, what minerals, what, you know, all of these associations with air, where the, the tarot suit, um, there's disagreement. Some people think it's wands, some people think it's swords. Uh, that's, you know, um, one, that's going to be a, a challenge for, for March is to ask you, which suit do you think is more appropriate for air and why? So that's kind of where I am with that, with these, uh, my, my, the challenges, you know, at, at this point. I was like, well, how, you know, what ways can we explore this, this idea of air a little bit more? So anyway, moving on from that. Uh, <laughs> Um, you know, and then there's other departments uh, they have challenges going on. Like uh, one thing that uh, jumped out at me, uh, there was a, a person on the Facebook uh, page who found a sigil outside of their door and was looking for um, in, in, uh, advice or information on how to interpret what that means. Well, as, as luck would have it, um, Professor Shadow Fox, uh, uh, Dean Shadow Fox, has a, a sigil challenge, like to create your own sigil, but I believe there's also um, an opportunity to uh, interpret a, a sigil. You have to go read the specifics on that, but that would be an interesting opportunity to really dissect that that sigil and maybe get some, some feedback on that. I think that would be a, a great opportunity. And also, um, what not, just offhand, what I remember, I think in the Department of Natural Philosophy, is it Dean Starhawk? I'm trying, you know, just relying on my memory here. There was uh, a challenge to go out in nature, to, to walk and to find like four things that have something to do with, with Earth. And I went, I went, I did that and went with, uh, with one of my minions, dragged her along in the pouring rain. And we were looking at these, these places like that. I, I consider like liminal places, things like that, like a hole in the ground or under a tree, or I have like a, where we leave some offerings under a bridge uh, to deal with like the uh, you know the, the spirits of the earth so that was one of the things i was thinking of also i had while we were out there got a uh, sample of uh, soil from the, the crossroads because that is something i i use in different workings and soil from like a lot of different uh, places like like the bank if you're doing prosperity work um you know, so here I am, I'm out there, I'm, I'm looking all up all this stuff, um, you know, finding associations with, like with Earth. And of course, you know, did I actually write this up and submit that? And no, no, I did not. <laughs> um, so yeah, I tend to get ahead of myself and I tend to have like a whole lot of things going on at once. And one of the things I, I wanted to share with you I thought would be kind of fun is uh, I just had a birthday because yes, it's February and I'm an Aquarius. I wanted to show you what I got because it's really exciting. And I think it would also demonstrate like, what does the apprentice wizard get for their birthday? And the other thing that I was, you know, was kind of thinking about, um, one of the videos uh, Provost Kingsley did recently, um, what the questions that I, I posed for him, I noticed he had his bookshelf. here. Only one of mine, this entire room, then it's a big room. Is all, is all bookshelves. I like over 2,000 books and that's only what's cataloged. But <laughs> I, you know, I noticed he had these books and I'm like, that tells me a lot about the person and what they're about and what they're interested in is if I know what they're reading. And I thought, so, you know, in all fairness, I will share with you like some of the, th the things that I'm reading because all of what I got for my birthday were books. And I'm very excited about that. So let me see, I have them all next to me. I could show you what I got and why. Um, okay, so some, this one, I'm not real familiar with this author, but it sounded really interesting. Honoring Your Ancestors, A Guide to Ancestral Veneration is Mallory Valdoise. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And I'm not going to zoom in because I'm trying to give my own ancestors some privacy, but I have an ancestor altar. I have an also altar to uh, Harriet Tubman um, and the, um, you know, the, the ancestors of the hoodoo tradition back there. So that is something, you know, important to me. So I'm always, you know, you know, interested in new view, uh, viewpoints on that. I'm trying to see where we could put this. It is not someplace flammable. This is very hot. Um, hmm, hmm, hmm. I, there's really no space here. Maybe there. Hopefully not have an avalanche. 
Um, here's a couple of books on, on Hoodoo by Byron Ballard. I hope I am pronouncing her name correctly. And Hoodoo is something um, I'm very interested in, folk magic in general. I am a dark arts major. That is one of the focuses of, of dark arts is low magic or what, uh, what we call sorcery. Speaking of sorcery, I have this, I got this companion volume. I'm not going to even try to pronounce that. It's the companion volume to this. I'm going to try and say on Carl Gwynn, it is by Robin Artisan. It's Sorcery and the Fairy Faith. So I got this to go with this, which is I'm already reading. It is incredible. Um, it's not the first thing I've re uh, read by uh, Robin Artisan. It's very well worth your time. Um, okay. Also going more from more hoodoo. It was actually... This came from a, a friend of mine who I actually met through the grace school and he's now like one of like my best friends for life. I met him like like 10 years ago now. Literally, yeah, it was because it was 2010. It's it crazy. So Old Style Conjure Hoodoo work, Root Work and Folk Magic by Star Cassis, um, well-known author, well-respected. And she wrote the, um, the foreword to this one which uh, it's uh, Backwoods Witchcraft Conjure and Folk Magic from Appalachia by Jake Richards. So, what else do I got here related to that? Because I know I have more. I don't know. I know I have another um, one on. Here it is. I see I have so much stuff going on over here. It's crazy. The Candle and the Crossroads, a book of Appalachian Conjure and Southern Root Work by Orion Foxwood. Um, so I got books stacked on top of books over here. A few other things here. So here's one, the New Orleans Voodoo Handbook, which is, it's not really about voodoo. It's more about the history of New Orleans, and it does like get into voodoo as relates to the history of New Orleans. I'm not really sure if it's any good or not. I haven't really gotten too far into it. Um, but we are, as a family, thinking about going to New Orleans this uh, this summer. Depends on where my oldest goes to college, what region of the country, and we'll probably just kind of explore that region. So she's like thinking of going to school in Florida. And of course, Florida is totally close to New Orleans. It isn't. But, you know, my, my family thinks nothing of jumping in the car and driving clear across the country in the back, and we've done that multiple times. So, yeah, yeah, Florida and New Orleans are, like, right next to each other, right? But, yeah, yeah, we totally do that. Um, but we'll see. And, uh, okay, so, yeah, being a, a dark arts major, you know, getting into some of the protection elements, some of the history on that. This is the Devil's Scourge exorcism during the Italian Renaissance. And this one, demonology and devil lore. So great stuff to, to, to read in the wee hours of the morning. Um, another book that I am really like crazy like taking notes on. This one, Morbid Magic, Death, Spirituality, and Culture from Around the World. I have actually been approved to uh, facilitate a discussion on this at one of the churches that I attended. I attend. That will be in June. And so, you know, with all apologies and respect to my instructors, I'm taking notes on this book, and it's like, how many pages of notes do I have on this book alone? Like, like a lot. And I'm not even, I'm only like a quarter of the way through it. So, ooh, the cauldron's really blaming now. Yeah, so, and then... Now, this is interesting, and I do want to, to, to say here, any, any opinions um, and reviews I express on, on these books are my own. Um, I don't think the, the Gray School takes any, um, any, per, any official view on any of these. So um, sh my opinion should not be taken to be representative of, of the school at all. They are just my own. Evil Archaeology, Demons, Possession, and Sinister Relics by Heather Lynn. And now this was an interesting book. Uh, I re have read the whole thing already. And lots of interesting material that she um, she covers. Now, if you if you read her reviews on Amazon, some people are less impressed with her scholarship. And I, I do have to say, I, I had some questions myself. You know, she talks a little bit about witch bottles, which, if you're not familiar, it's a, a protective bottle that uh, you know it's for protection against being attacked. 
And in this bottle, you, you put urine and lots of sharp objects. And the idea is the urine, which is your own urine, or any other, like, um, you know, personal concern, if it's if blood or hair or whatever, that is supposed to attract whatever is attacking you because it's supposed to be fooled that that's you in that bottle. And you put all those sharp, uh, nasty objects, broken glass and thorns and nails, and it's supposed to be trapped there. Well, uh, Dr. Lin here s suggests that the way those work is that it causes the, um, the witch who is attacking you to have trouble peeing. Um, never heard that one before. I did, I did actually Google that to see. I, I cannot find any merit to that. So with, with all due respect, I, yeah, I'm not buying that. She had some other interesting things to point out. However, like she talked about these toilet demons, like demons that would attack you when you use the toilet that occur across various cultures. And, you know, the, um, the symptoms of being attacked by a toilet demon, that thing is really crackly. Can you hear it? Or she can't answer me. Like it's really going. Um, so the symptoms are like neurological symptoms. It's making me a little nervous now. It's really, I've never heard it do that before. Um, so neurological symptoms like, uh, like having a stroke or having seizures. And as I'm reading this, I'm like, this sounds really familiar. I think I've known people who've succumbed to these toilet demons and, and not, not saying this to be funny because it actually isn't. And you got to think what it must have been like if you have people who are young and seemingly healthy in the prime of their life and they get up and they use the bathroom and they drop dead and they're having seizures. Well, this sounds familiar because I, I know people that this, this has happened to. And no, it wasn't demons. They had brain aneurysms. And I got to think way back, you know, maybe thousands of years ago, uh, when we didn't have modern medical technology, you would not have seen that going on in somebody's head. Someone young goes to the bathroom and it's... This is unpleasant, to you, but if you're a little bit stopped up and you're straining, if you have a brain aneurysm that makes you like like seven times more likely to die on the toilet, and um, I I had a reference on that where I looked that up. It's from I'm going to have to add that to. For some reason, that window was closed, but I'm going to have to add that uh, um, citation. I it was on a things that contribute to, uh, to brain aneurysms, and yes, straining on the toilet. So that had to seem like pretty de demonic back then. Um, so another another kind of interesting thing she, she talks about, and she just kind of hints at it, it's like she kind of goes to like kind of a, a juicy little morsel and then she lets it go, is this idea that uh, that gin, like, like genies, like the genie in the bottle, but they're called gin, D-G-I-N-N, sometimes J-I-N-N, um, that they are literally a type of microbe and that to become possessed by them, like you would in inhale them and become sick. So, and she said, you know, there's Muslim scholars who state this is true. Well, she kind of, kind of holds that morsel out there a couple of different times in the book and doesn't really go into it. But what was really nice at the end of the book, she has all of these, uh, and all of her citations. So I, I tracked that citation down. And I went, I found it, it's on this uh, site, uh, academia.edu. I actually got the paper, it's called Spirits Are Like Microbes, Islamic Revival and the Definition of Morality in Moroccan Exorcism, Joseph Luis Mateo Dieste. Um, it was interesting, the site, acad academia.edu, uh, I go on there and, you know, it uses whatever that, that magical... Uh, formula, that magical algorithm that uh, the internet does to determine people I might possibly know. You know like, even people I'm not fr with friends, uh, friends with on Facebook, it can, like, determine, like, multiple degrees of separation, and it's saying, oh, do you want to follow these, uh, these people that we've determined you know? <laughs> and, they're, and they weren't wrong. And, but it's, it's interesting, because a lot of the people on there, there were a lot of my uh, grade, grade school professors, other apprentices, so if you are un, under the illusion, illusion that you have any privacy, you don't. And I'm thinking, you know, from a, a magical perspective, um, 
you know, who needs the Akashic record when you have Google, you know? <laughs> um, so it, and it's like that other book that I was reading, the one about the, the, the morbid magic, you know, it's, I'm, I'm reading about the, the Egyptians, like how your, your soul is judged by, or your heart is judged by how, how pure it is against the weight of a feather. Well, I think I would, uh, take my chances more like having the content of my character judged against the weight of the feather than I would by if someone actually looked at my search history. That is much more damning, I assure you. So anyway, so yeah, I got this this article and, and I printed out. And of course, I'm, I'm reading it when the, the, the kids are at the dentist because it's, isn't this what most people read when their kids are at the dentist? It's a really fascinating article about, um, about gin and possession and exorcism. And lots of interesting stuff. Like I have all kinds of stuff that I've underlined here that is it's really neat. And they talk of this one part about they only come out at night because it can't stand ultraviolet light. And it says there are studies that have attempted to scientifically prove their existence with mathematic mathematic formulas to calculate their mass and speed. So I'm like, really? Well, this guy, um, this uh uh, uh, Joseph Luis Mateo Dieste has lots and lots of lots and lots of citations. So I looked them up, <laughs> and one of them is in French, which I can't read, so I had to rule that one out. But the other one, um, I did track down, and it's a it's a book. Oh, do I still have it up? Um, I don't have it up. So I'm just going to tell you what it is. No, I can't. Here it is, because I'm reading it off the citation here. It is Mahmoud Jawaid. I hope I am not slaughtering his name. The, the book is called Secrets of Angels, Demons, Satans, and Jinn, Decoding Their Nature Through Quran and Science. So I did obtain that. In fact, I the author very generously uh shared the, the PDF with me. I contacted him. I found him on uh, that academia site. So, I, I mean, I was I was just blown away that he's like, oh, yeah, here's my... Uh, he just like, don't share it with anyone, which I'm, I'm not going to. But um, but he does make, um, you know, some some interesting claims. He, he uses... He starts from a standpoint of, of faith. He's... Clearly, he believes in the Koran, um, literally. And if the he goes by if the description of the jinn in the Quran is correct, if he's accepting that as true out of the box, what could we say is scientifically true to match that? And this is a man who has um, a background in um, a chemical chemistry, um, I guess, uh, engineering and, and research. As I was uh, reading about his background, so it's interesting that you know if he knows what. The Quran says, and he's got, he has to figure out, okay, scientifically, what would have to be true in order for that to be true. He comes to a lot of really in, uh, interesting conclusions, such as like gin being made of carbon dioxide, and he can calculate from that how what their speed would be. And he also said, like, because given what their maximum speed could be, they can't break out of the Earth's atmosphere because they would have to be something like 25,000 miles per hour, and carbon dioxide can't go that fast. So... It, you know, granted how seriously you take this could depend on, you know, do you believe in the Quran or not? But what I found intriguing about it is, you know, there is this difficulty, I think, with any kind of paranormal um, investigation, is if you're dealing with these sort of metaphysical entities and you want to know if, if they exist, if you, if you don't know if they operate by the laws that we are familiar with, or what they're, you know, made of. We don't know if there is a way we can prove them, you know, or how. If if there was a way, how would that be? So when he talks about these things having actual physical characteristics that you might be able to to look for, maybe develop a test for, that is intriguing to me. So I, I have no idea whether he is um, is correct or incorrect. But this was just, you know, really a fascinating idea for me to explore so that has been like my past week is like going crazy like in th that book that's like a 250 page book so <laughs> here i am you know i'm supposed to be like working on my, my studies and i mean 
which is an ongoing thing. Like, just sitting right here, okay, so, um, uh, Dean Starhawk, I mean, his, if he's still the one teaching it, sometimes these classes get shuffled around, but he was the one teaching it when I enrolled, it's about the intro to ghosts, and I have, because I was doing the research, the, this is not a birthday gift, it just happened to be sitting here, because I'm working on it. The Complete Book of Ghosts, A Fascinating Exploration of the Spirit World from Apparitions to Haunted Places. Also, um, the Encyclopedia of Ghosts and Spirits. So, Rosemary Ellen Gilly? I, I never know how to pronounce people's names. Um, so, lots of stuff going on here. Uh, <laughs> it seemed like there was something more I was going to share with you. I just have, like, books, like, like everywhere. But one thing, I guess, yeah, because I thought I had a couple of other books. I don't know where I put them. I'm, I'm sure they're upstairs on the, because uh, I tried to, it, probably upstairs on the uh, dining room table because I was starting to do a video with the kids up there, and it just wasn't going well at all. But... It's how I, I came to have a library of over 2,000 books that it is continuously growing. Is I um, subscribe to a list that is, um, you know, it, it tells me all of the, like, used book sales, Friends of Library book sales in the tri-state area. Tri-states being Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware. And, you know, I go to these things. Ooh, my cauldron finally burned out. Um, so I go to these these things. And you, you can find books usually in like the, the 50 cent to a dollar range if you go on, usually on the last day of the sale, maybe you, you can get a bag of books for like $5. And I amass tons and tons of stuff. And it might not even be something I'm necessarily going to read cover to cover. Maybe I won't even ever open it. But if it's something I go, okay, I might at some point be researching that and I want to know about it. And I will come home, you know, I'll put it on the, the bookshelf. And what has happened multiple times for me is I will be doing a, an essay for the for the Grace School and realize that I have this really obscure title. Like I'll be doing the, um, you know, Googling it and it'll mention like, oh, this, according to this author and this book. And it's like, I have that book. I know. I remember picking that book up. And this has happened to me multiple times. There's some really unusual books. And so I, you know, I just recommend, like, you know, go search these uh, sales out, you know, like anything that's like related to mythology. If you're interested in the natural philosophy department, like any kind of field guides. Uh, for a while, I was interested in uh, math magics. And I, mean, I picked up books like about like the history of pi, like PI, you know, 3.14, however many digits into infinity. Um, and, and a book on infinity, on, you know, the concept of infinity. Of infinity. And, man, I, I think I have, I have books like a, that really would relate to every department in the school. And I highly recommend that you, you di diversify because I've, like, changed my, my major, like, so many times. It's, it's dizzying. Um, but I'm definitely in it for the, the dark arts now. But, so that, that's my, my advice. Uh, go out, uh, Every, every used book sale that you, you know, come across, build up your library and then you be le like me, just like swamped in books and um, can't ever, <laughs> can't ever complete anything because I'm always like going down these rabbit holes and, and learning about uh, gin being made of carbon dioxide and, and trying to wrap my mind around that. So, anyway, um, did I, you know, I, I showed you like the notes for the one... And it's like the rest of this notebook is the notes about the about the jinn. And you know, I haven't gotten to his section on angels, which he says are made of light particles. So yeah, that's going to be really cool too. So yeah, that intro to, to ghosts uh, essay that I've been working on, it might like take a back seat to figuring out what angels are made up of, because because that's what what inquiring minds want to know, right? <laughs> So until later, very blessed be.